Welcome everybody to a Walls webinar. I'm John S. Quarterman. I'm the Samwani Riverkeeper. That's a staff position and a program with Walls Watershed Coalition Inc. Walls been around since 2012. I've been doing this Riverkeeper thing since December 2016. The Riverkeeper does advocacy. There's all sorts of other stuff like water quality testing and water trails and outings, mostly handled by committees of volunteers. Okay, so today we have a special guest. That will be Larry Woodward. He is the um, assistant manager, I believe that's correct, deputy refuge manager at the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. And he's going to talk about water, wildlife, and wilderness and the importance of the three national wildlife refuges of the Somani, except actually it's four, he's pointed out. So we will hear him talk about that. And he has the experience. He has previously worked at refuges in two other states and also at the lower Somani Cedar Keys Refuge. So... He's eminently qualified to talk about these subjects. And rather than hear me natter on, um, oh, yes, at the end, we're going to have at least 10 minutes of question and answer. If you have a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat, but, you know, please wait until the end to ask it verbally, orally. And uh, then uh, Larry will attempt to address your questions. And in the meantime, Larry's going to tell us about water, wildlife, and wilderness. Over to you, Larry. All right. Well, thank you, John. Hey, I really appreciate being a part of this. And uh, hopefully the information, uh, I'm not a hydrologist, but, uh, you know, and this whole system is a water system. So uh, I'm going to do my best to really highlight the National Wildlife Refuges on both the headwaters and the uh, the the end of the Swanee River uh, drainage and how valuable it is both to uh, uh, the wildlife but resource the wetlands and water resources as well so I'm going to try and uh, do my best to get this to share my screen and uh, I got a convoluted system here which I don't know quite uh, I'm trying to, <laughs> to see this. I'm going to close my screen here. Let's see, share. No Zoom is complete without some technical issues. And I believe uh, it's not. Here we go. And I'm going to. Share this thing and uh, get it on the slides. And here we go. Can you uh, are you able to see just the, uh, the slide itself or is it that duplicate one? I see the slide, and on the left, there's a bunch of little slides, and on the right, there's alt text. Oh, okay. Let me... Uh... Yeah, let me try and uh... get this on the other one. There, you know, you deal with these multiple screens and it's pretty confusing sometimes. Um, thought it says you're doing slideshow. I thought that usually meant you just got the slide. Okay, let me figure out how to um, get it to that screen. Uh, <clears throat> it's wanting to go to uh, my other screen for whatever reason. It, 
I'm gonna put my camera down for one second. We still know you're there. <laughs> And I'm trying to get this. Uh, let's see, get, I tell you, let me try this. Is this, uh, am I, does it look like it's working now? Or did I just kind of confuse this slide and the one next slide? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, folks. Let me just figure out how to uh, get this one slide. Which is so I, I don't do Zoom, so it's all a learning experience, and uh, apparently it's quite a challenging. Let me do it this way. That there. Also, yay! At least, at least you can see it. I kind of downsized that other one, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, keep my screen on where you can see me, but also uh, go through the slideshow. But anyway, yes, I'm Larry Woodward. <laughs> Sorry about the dif difficulty, but uh, I'm the deputy manager at the uh, Okinoki National Wildlife Refuge, which also manages uh, Banks Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And I've been here uh, about three years. And prior to that, I was at the Lower Suwannee and Cedar Keys National Wildlife Refuges as refuge in refuge management, and uh, I was there for about 11 years. So I've got a good grasp of both uh, ends of the Suwannee River. The middle part I'm not so familiar with, but uh, I know the wildlife that comes through the lower Suwannee and, uh, and down from the, the Okie Finoki are uh, in that area as well. So it's all similar, but different habitats. But anyway, it's just an amazing uh, resource and system that we have, and uh, it's well worth protecting. And um, just a, uh, and I, hopefully it'll uh, come through and, and while I'm talking about the refuges. But yes, the four the wildlife, water, wildlife, and wilderness, the four national wildlife refuges of the Suwannee. And um, I'm gonna go through this and I'm gonna kind of hit some highlights and then kind of dive deeper into the refuges and uh, the importance of each refuge for the, within the system of the, uh, the Swanee River. Now, of course, and this is uh, talking to a lot of Swanee experts and enthusiasts that go out on Swanee a lot, so a lot of this stuff might not be new. And, uh, but uh, of course, the Swanee River uh, originates from the Okefenokee Swamp in Southern Georgia and uh, meanders down to the Gulf of Mexico in Florida. And it winds nearly 250 miles. Uh, there's some different miles people give, but uh, that's a rough uh, estimate and a median. Uh, and it goes everywhere through swamps, limestone, uh, high limestone banks, hammocks and hardwoods, salt marshes, and, um, and the Swanee River Basin. The, uh, it covers roughly uh, 10,000 square miles, which is pretty impressive. Uh, it's a federally designated wild river. I did uh, see the designation as a wild river, and down there in orange, um, it was it's it was designated in 1974 as a national wild and scenic river. And I wanted to put that in there because it has never been designated as that, but it's been uh, uh, nominated to be designated. And for whatever reason, I'm not sure why it never has. Maybe we need to. Uh, to look at that and revisit that and try and push that forward for uh, to increase protection of the Swanee River. Uh, and again, the uh, there's different variations on how many springs there are, but I've seen anywhere from 55 to 350 springs. And uh, I love Florida and I love all their springs. So I, uh, I'm sticking with 350 because uh, it just sounds really good. And it's, uh, and what's, what's so great about the Suwannee River, it's still, um, it's not impeded anyway by man-made structures. Uh, it's still a, a functional flowing river that's in its natural state for the most part, and it's not dammed or diked or re-diverted or anything like that. Uh, and a couple of highlights uh, at the value of the Suwannee River, and, there, and I'll go through more, but uh, 
of course, uh, something I was working with, with FWC and University of Florida and those guys, they were doing some uh, alligator snapping turtle work. And um, in doing so, they were noticing there was differences between other populations, alligator swamp uh, snapping turtles. And uh, it later, we later found out uh, it's the, uh, uh, it's a, its own genetic species. It was a thought that it might be a subspecies, but it turns out it's its own species, which is really neat. So it's uh, really uh native to only the Swanee system. So that's uh, just, that was a great uh, uh, discovery. And uh, and one thing great about the Swanee River and that I love, because I love black water and uh, it remains black as one of the few rivers or maybe the only river that that consistently stays black the whole way down. And that's a good, uh, that's a very good representative representation of uh, water quality. There's not too much uh, sedimentation coming in from, say, agriculture or whatever from communities. Um, and that's mainly because of the swamps. And But a lot of it is because of the, uh, uh, the protections we do have. Anyway, but anyway, uh, it, it is real unique that it it doesn't turn brown anywhere. So it is being muddy sediment filled waters. And um, I'm showing a map here of just to kind of give you an idea of the Suwannee River and how it flows through from Georgia down to through Florida. And um, of course the, blue, in the north end of the blue line, hopefully you can see my cursor there. That's the Okefenokee Swamp. And uh, right above on the northeast of Valdosta about six, seven miles is uh, Banks Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And of course, tributaries come down towards the, uh, the Swanee as well. And I'll go into more detail of that. And then it meanders down and um, ends up into the Gulf of Mexico. And again, this is showing some the watershed map of the Swanee on the, on the left side there to give you an idea of how vast this uh, you know, the watershed is. And again, before we get back into the, the nitty gritty of the water resources and wildlife resources and refuges, I just wanted to throw out just a kind of a, a refuge overview of what the National Wildlife Refuge System is and who we are. And uh, again, it was began uh, in 1903 by President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he established Pelican Island, which is in the very Southeast of Florida. Uh, it was a three acre island there to protect a uh, nesting colony of birds down there. And uh, that was the first National Wildlife Refuge. And since then, we've kind of expanded to uh, over 570 National Wildlife Refuges, and, and which includes actually the, if you've heard about the National Marine Monuments uh, that were started, uh, actually, George Bush. Uh, the younger George Bush started it, and uh, I think Barack Obama added a couple more. Uh, but we, we have five, or yeah, five uh, marine monuments, and then 38 waterfowl production areas, which uh, ends up being, we protect 96 million acres of land and 760 million acres of marine, uh, marine waters and sanctuaries. So that's a lot of a lot of real estate that the National Wildlife Refuges um, manage. And that's with uh, about 2,500 people. <laughs> so with all these, there's uh, we're pretty skinny for the most part. But anyway, we do what we can and we're passionate. And just real quick, uh, just uh, kind of the um, overview of what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Wildlife Refuge System is. And uh, we're established to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation management and where appropriate restoration of fish, wildlife, and plant resources and their habitats within the United States. And that is for the benefit of present and future generations of America. So uh, our focus is protection of natural resources and the wildlife in which they live. And, uh, and national wildlife refuges are real unique as opposed to BLM property or National Park Service or any other property uh, for service. We are established 
specifically were for wildlife and wildlife comes first in our decision making. In, in other words, when we're established, uh, the, all the property is closed until we deem what's appropriate uses uh, that won't inter- impact the wildlife that use that area and live there. Uh, and that's uh, different from the BLM and uh, National Park Service and Forest Service where they're where, when they're established, everything is open to the public until they figure out what where the issues are and then they start narrowing it down and determining the appropriate uses in another direction is what we do because wildlife always comes first when the National Wildlife Refuge System and because uh, that's why we're here, obviously. And um, so we, we, we really uh, promote outdoor recreation and wildlife oriented recreation, uh, but where it's appropriate and how we, how, where it won't impact wildlife and the resources. So we're a little more controlled, but it's for a reason, but we're, we really promote uh, visitation, which I'll get into a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Okay, the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, just a phenomenal resource. And uh, I encourage y'all to come visit. Uh, and some overview, it's, uh, it's a 406,000 acre National Wildlife Refuge. It was established in 1936 and um, designated as the National Wildlife Refuge in 1937, but it was protected in 1936. And it was a kind of a grassroots grassroots movement that uh, that a lot of nonprofit groups and that really loved the 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 resource and the swamp and a lot of this include the um, uh, oh, anyway um, the the swamp is the headwaters of the uh, the, the Suwannee River. Uh, it's, it begins in the swamp. And it's also the headwaters, the Okefenokee Swamp is also the headwaters of the St. Mary's River. So the, the, the Suwannee River discharges from the Suwannee from the southeast end, east end. Um, and the southwest, I'm sorry, the on the western side, the, south, <laughs> the southwestern is where the Suwannee River drains down and through Florida and down into the Gulf of Mexico, and the, which is really unique. We also have the St. Mary's River that uh, is the where the headwaters of the St. Mary's River, which flows eastward towards the uh, Atlantic Ocean, which is very uh, interesting. <clears throat> uh, but what's so, uh, some of the neat characteristics of the Okefenokee Swamp is, is it, it's gone through a, a lot of history of logging. Well, actually, in late 1800s, they tried to drain the swamp. They tried to drain the swamp to uh, to promote farming in the area and uh, kind of dry it out and ditch it and dike it and that kind of thing to to make it agriculture lands. And uh, after quite a few years of digging it, they call it a swan. It was a Swanee Canal Company. And they, they dug into the swamp quite a bit and they about 10 miles and they realized it was not going to work because they had to go through a, a sand ridge. They were headed east to try and drain it into the St. Mary's River and they realized they couldn't get through that sand ridge without it collapsing and um, caving in on them, which is a good thing because they just gave up. And then it went to logging. Uh, the Hebert Timber Company ended up purchasing the property. And they logged most of the old historical, old age uh, cypress trees out of the swamp. But in doing that, they uh, the great thing of, about the res- the after <laughs> the after effects of the, of the logging, it did not impact the hydrology at all. So it's still a natural system, even though the trees were removed, and but oh, of course the trees are all back now, but they're just not quite as old, but uh, they've, uh, the hydrology is intact, so it's never been altered, uh, it's just been kind of given a good haircut kind of thing, but the, the, the base 
functioning hydro hydrological model is still there. So, uh, um, which is a good thing. Uh, in but what's unique with this swamp, and since there has not been any impacts to the um, the hydrology in the swamp itself, it was a, it was created by some uh, back when the the oceans were higher about seven thousand years ago, and when the waters receded, um, there was a and I'll get into I'll show you a map of the the trail ridge. There was a natural sand dune barrier island type formation that held the water into the uh, in the swamp. So when the water receded, the oceans receded. It was caught by the the water. Essentially, had a natural dam called Trail Ridge that held the water in the swamp, and it's uh, remained there ever since. And of course, it's uh, what what's been created is a just a huge, huge peat bog, and it's not only a peat bog, but it's uh, turned into a uh, just a very significant carbon sink. Um, of course, and again, um, to to give you some of the numbers of the carbon, uh, there's approximately 140 million metric tons of carbon that's stored within the peat in, in this system. And within that, uh, it translates to 514 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. And that's a lot of carbon. And to get that, to make it kind of relevant, I guess, or where you can somewhat relate to it, the 2022 data, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide that is um, that is expended by vehicles and stuff like that. Um, the carbon sink that is stored inside the Okefenokee is about eight percent of that amount. So eight percent of all the carbon dioxide that's put out by vehicles and industry and all that, eight percent of that. It, what's equivalent to eight percent of that is stored in the peat within the within the refuge or within this within the swamp, and when it's stored, obviously it's not causing problems. Uh, when it's released, it can cause problems. If it was ever drained or uh, altered in any significant way, where that that the peat is exposed, that carbon has the opportunity to, to escape through fires and stuff like that, some catastrophic fires. And I'll get more into fires a little bit later. But, uh, but also in 1974, um, 353,000 acres of this pristine wetland was designated national wilderness, making it the third largest wilderness east of the Mississippi River. And uh, in 1986, the Okefenokee was designated uh, uh, by the Wetland Convention as the wetland of international importance. And that's a good significant uh, uh, recognition. It's also, uh, of course, we've been on the uh, nominated for a World Heritage Site, and that's for whatever reason became controversial. I'm not sure why, but the, that's quite a designation that would really bring in a lot of uh, uh, more attention to the refuge. And what's really another thing that's really unique about the Okefenokee is it's, of course, it's 700 square miles of swamp. And just about all of it is National Wildlife Refuge. There's just a little bit of it that's outside our, our boundaries, but, uh, but I think 96% of it is National Wildlife Refuge. So, but what's interesting, it's about 70%, and that's the lower estimate um, of the actual water that uh, creates the swamp is rainwater. Uh, so there's no big tributaries coming into the system. There's some on the north northwest portion up in the Waycross area. And that is, uh, but that's relatively small, uh, roughly 20%. Um, and with that, 80% of the rainfall is 
release through transpiration through trees and such like that, leaving about 20% to find its way down the Suwannee River and the St. Mary's River. And uh, of course, most of it, uh, the system drains into the Suwannee River, about 85% of the, the swamp drains into the Suwannee and the remainder drains into to, to create the, uh, the St. Mary's River. And I want to throw out there the visitation. It's about 600,000 visitors visit the Okefenokee Swamp every year. And we'll hit a couple of uh, little highlights about uh, Okefenokee before we head to the next refuge. But anyway, this diagram here shows the Trail Ridge. And it shows the, the yellow spot being uh, the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge on the north by, northern part. And Okefenokee is in, primarily in Georgia, but it does extend into Florida. And then our neighbor, the Osceola uh, National Forest and the Wildlife Management Area is uh, south of us. But the trail ridge is that red area. And the trail ridge is uh, about 30, 40 feet or so higher than the swamp itself. So it's a big natural sand ridge that used to be a sandbar, maybe a barrier island, but it's holding um, water in, into the swamp. Because uh, just to the west of it, or to the east of it, I'm sorry, is the, uh, you can see the same areas coming south. You can see my cursor. It comes south, drains through out of the Okefenokee Swamp and comes through a natural break in the trail ridge and then comes out and it's, a, it's the separation between Florida and uh, Georgia. But it's the, it, like the, uh, the Suwannee River, that St. Mary's River is <laughs> just an amazing river, very unique and uh, just a phenomenal resource itself. But anyway, I want to show that graphic just to kind of give you an idea of this trail ridge, because it comes up, you, we talk about mining issues that's here and we're, we have some, uh, uh, interest in mining along this trail ridge, which essentially digs into the trail ridge. So uh, you'll get an understanding of what that is. And the beginnings of a river. This is where uh, the top left uh, slide is just the vastness of Okefenokee Swamp from uh, I was flying in a helicopter, took that picture. And then it meanders down to uh, at the very edge of the swamp, Back in the, you'll see that, that water control structure in the middle picture. That was built in the 60s. And the idea, there was a long berm and a couple of these water control structures that were built to impound some wa the water of the Okefenokee Swamp because they were terrified of the catastrophic wildfires that were occurring. And the last major one was in the 1950s. So they thought they could build this and it would maintain water in Okefenokee Swamp. Well, it only maintained water in about uh, less than 10% of the swamp. And so they said, well, that's, and plus it was just messing with the hydrology. So what we ended up doing in the um, uh, 70s and then later in the 80s, we opened up those water control structures and then we breached the long dike that they built in the 50s to impound that water. Um, so they're the, to, to re reestablish that natural flow that goes down to the Suwannee River, because that that did block the Suwannee the water going down to the, the Suwannee River. And again, the other picture is just the headwaters of the Suwannee River, just right where it begins. Um, anyway, I just wanted to talk to you about that. Um, we call it the, the Suwannee Seal, that middle picture and the water control structures there, but um, they, they're not functional anymore. They're all open and water flows through that whole system. Eventually, we'd like to remove them, but that takes a lot of money. But we'll, we're hoping to do that at some point. And I just want to throw this out there. Inhabitants, some of the inhabitants, early inhabitants of the Okefenokee uh, are uh, Pogo, if, you, if some of y'all remember the, the Pogo comic strip. And so I threw a couple of those Pogo, some of the famous Pogo uh, comic strips in there. And he is from the Okefenokee Swamp. And uh, yeah, and of course, it, every the whole story is about him being from the Okefenokee Swamp. But and a lot of people knew that. Uh, some people don't. So I wanted to throw it out there. But also, um, 
I wanted to throw out that a lot of people don't know that Kermit Frog is also from the Okefenokee Swamp. And that, that comic down there is uh, depicts that the frog showing Miss Piggy um, <laughs> where he came from. So uh, there's a lot of nice uh, history there. I couldn't uh, pass that away. So anyway, we're going into the Okefenokee Swamp, which is the headwaters of the Suwannee. And I just want to throw out some pictures of the the how the uniqueness of uh, the Okefenokee Swamp, and it's a headwater swamp, which is very unusual. Most swamps are at the where the where the rivers meet the ocean, or at the end of their flowing uh, their destination, it creates a swamp of some sort, and then uh, then it drains. But Okefenokee is so unique in that in the whole river system with the Suwannee is that it's a, a headwater swamp, uh, which is just really unique. But in, in that, um, along with all the peat, there's a lot of very, the vegetation is just phenomenal. There's over 625 species of plants that have been found in the Okie Swamp. And that's just phenomenal. And what that really shows you is that it's intact. It's a natural system. Um, that's just incredibly diverse as far as the vegetation. And that's just a good indicator of uh, uh, the richness and protection of this resource and that it's, it's been maintained in this natural state. And the uh, vegetation is uh, when you, because when places have been disturbed, you might have 10 to 15, 20 species of plants. Uh, when it's been heavily disturbed. And to have 625 or so species is very unique. But what's also unique is the, all the um, predatory plants that we have, uh, which is very you know, unusual. Quite a few pit, different types of pitcher plants. One I'm real unique to uh, the Swanee. Um, and then we have sundews and bladderworts and uh, uh, some of the other uh, milkwort kind of deal. Uh, but anyway, it's just uh, uh, just an incredible system. So uh, I would invite you all to please come, come and explore a little bit. And some of the wild uh, swamp life that's in the Okefenokee. Uh, I just want to throw out a couple of things. We do have some really cool rookeries out there. Um, uh, they're not real accessible, so don't plan on going to look at the rookeries just because they're uh, the vastness of this uh, this area, and they're in some very remote areas. But we do have some really significant rookeries, which are mainly uh, uh, wading birds, ibis, egrets, herons, um, uh, and of course the green heron, little blue heron. Uh, the great blue herons, the white ibis, uh, black crown night herons, uh, lots of cattle egrets meander in there and uh, nest amongst the other birds. But there, of course, there's a lot of, we have, there's a couple of owls, I mean, quite a few owls out there that you always see. And the barred owls are good because they like to just stare at you. And that, I caught this one with this young, it was feeding it a little, some kind of rodent. But some of the other animals, of course, there's lots of alligators and turtles and uh, uh, some really cool damselflies and uh, dragonflies. The picture in the middle bottom are the eyes of an alligator at night. So I took a picture of it and it came out good enough where I figured I'd just share it with you. Anyway, let me go to uh, the next slide. And this is um, the wilderness experience. And what that's what we do at the Okefenokee is provide a wilderness experience for our uh, for our visitors. And you can reserve actually platforms that are scattered throughout. And I'll show a, a slide in a little bit. I'll kind of give you a better idea of the, the trail system. But um, you know, people love to go out and kayak and canoe to these really remote areas. We have 120 miles. Um, of maintained trails, which is quite a challenge for us to keep these trails maintained. And of course, the 10 platforms that you can uh, reserve to, to camp on and make your way, you can do certain routes and get through. 
but it's very unique. It's a dark sky park. Um, just phenomenal uh, to be out there and just, uh, it's the most remote place in Georgia. <laughs> they did a study in uh, Floyd's Island, which is out in the middle of the, the swamp, it has been designated the most remote um, place in Florida. All right, Georgia, I'm sorry. And we have three entry points, the refuge headquarters and the visitor center on the east side. Then we have the west side entrance, which is the Stephen C. Foster State Park, which is actually a state park that's inside the National Wildlife Refuge, which is very unique. It's, it's, on, it's on refuge property. They have a long-term lease with us and they're great partners of ours. And Kingfisher Landing is on the, the northeast uh, off uh, um, entry from the northeast section and it's a really there's no you know you're kind of on your own but it's a nice little parking area nice launch and uh people like to fish there and stuff like that but it's a really um uh established little landing people can visit as well and enter into the refuge and we a lot of people love to come in and fish on all three sides and this map on the left shows you the trail system. We have them labeled by color, the orange trail, blue trail, green trail, red trail, uh, the brown trail and the pink trail and that kind of thing. And it goes to different platforms, but uh, and this, these maps are available um, in our brochure and online. And the, the, the sign, we have everything signed. You, you'll know where you're going. We have mile markers and signs and stuff to help you, but it's not over signed, so don't expect too many signs and just at points where uh people get, get can get lost we kind of direct them in the right direction by a little arrow sign and here's banks lake national wildlife refuge and uh, again it's a 3600 acre national wildlife refuge established in 1985 um it, it talks a little bit about how it was established by the fish and wildlife act of 1956 and the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act of 1965. And, uh, and what's really unique, and you know, I, I have to admit, I didn't kind of put it all together until I was asked to do this tough presentation and include Banks Lake. And Banks Lake is a tributary of the, uh, of the Suwannee River as well. And uh, uh, I, I, so I do, I did learn some. And what's, because it's part of the Grand Bay, uh, it's called the Grand Bay Banks Lake uh, uh, watershed. And what it does is drain into a, a area called uh, Mud Swamp Creek, in it, which forms the Alapahoochee River. And the Alapahoochee River flows south into Florida into the Alapaha River and ultimately drains into the Swanee River. So, uh, uh, you know, that's, but it's a beautiful little refuge. It's relatively small. It's a unfunded, unstaffed refuge, but we ma manage and maintain it. We do have a little area that uh, you can go to and uh, launch a boat. And there's a little store there that's actually the county runs it for us and sells drinks and stuff like that and help you get, get established and oriented. We got some trails there, but uh just a great resource, an absolutely gorgeous lake. Uh, and it was, it's a natural Carolina Bay, a Pocosin type system that was created back when the ocean was receding as well. And then uh, they, years, uh, years ago, uh, I don't know, somewhere, the back, they tried to, in the mid 19th century, uh, they built a dam across it. Uh, to the, one of the outflows and they tried to, they, well, they made and established a grist mill, which, uh, which actually really established that area as a trading area, which um, um, was really neat. So, um, but anyway, it was later sold to the conservation fund because they were gonna, the, the people who owned it wanted to drain it and remove all the stumps uh, for, um, you know, the fat lighter type stuff and for, um whatever they were going to do with it but they, that's what they were going to do the conservation fund bought it and it later was purchased by the uh the federal government for the u.s for banks like national wildlife refuge but that wasn't too long ago in 1985 that's when it was established 
And these are a couple of the pictures of Banks Lake. It's just a, a just a large open lake. There's a lots of extended extended wetlands that you can't really get into because it's so dense. But it's all swampy areas. But the main lake is where people love to get get out and fish. We have a fishing pier there and boat launch, and it's just a great area to picnic and stuff like that. But it's just full of uh, cypress trees and um, just an absolutely beautiful spot. And then the Lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge. We've gone our way down, which uh, I didn't realize I jumped all these. I, I, and again, there's a big gap of river, uh, approximately 200 miles uh, between these refuges. But, I, uh, but since I'm focusing on National Wildlife Refuges, uh, and that's primarily what I know about, you know, I've kind of flow past uh, that midsection and dive right into the lower section. But the Lower Suwannee National Wildlife Refuge again was and oh, again yeah. was established in 1985. Um, and what's so unique about the Lower Suwannee National Wildlife Refuge? It was established to protect. It wasn't established to protect this specific species or ecosystem or uh, like a lot of most uh, every other refuge, but it was to protect the high the high water quality of the historic Suwannee River is why it was established. And uh, which is very, very unique for uh, a National Wildlife Refuge to be established because it's usually focused on wildlife or a particular species or a group of species or um, uh, um, um, anyway. So, but it was protected for uh, the Suwannee River and to protect the uh, last 20, actually it's the last 20 miles of the National, uh, of the Suwannee River is National Wildlife Refuge. So that gives a lot of protection to the coastal area. And again, that's a good target area for people to develop and stuff like that. So uh, what's also great, other than 20 miles of, uh, of uh, the last 20 miles of the Suwannee River is the 30 miles of coastline along the Suwannee, that make up the Suwannee Sound or uh, Suwannee Estuary. Uh, is protected as well with the with the Lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge, and it's fifty three thousand acre refuge. Uh, and again, it talks about what it protects, which I just covered. And uh, and this refuge um, protects an area. And what was it? So, w being the last twenty miles, that's critical for where the the sturgeon. The Gulf sturgeon, which is a threatened species, uh, the Suwannee River is the last major uh, migration area. Now, they utilize other rivers in the Gulf, the North Gulf, the Big Bend area, but the Suwannee River is what really uh, carries that population. Uh, the other ones have issues, different problems. The Suwannee is, doesn't have those problems, so the Suwannee is pretty much uh, a pristine uh, unimpeded waterway, so the sturgeon are able to get up to do their spawning, uh, and it's critical for their for their uh, survival. I wanted to throw that in there because uh, when you go down there in the summertime, you'll see the sturgeon jumping everywhere, and those are some big monsters coming out of the water. And uh, and there's about two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, or so visitors each year for the at the Lower Swanee Refuge. And so these are some of the species. The upper right is the the Gulf sturgeon, but there's a Swanee moccasin shell, which is a, a small mollusk, but but it's it's another threatened species. It's only found in the Swanee River Basin, so uh, that's another critical habitat and critical critical uh, species. And uh, the bottom left there, that's a picture of my, actually my son. We were doing some research and we were catching some alligator, the Suwannee alligator snapping turtles. That's a relatively small one for, a, for a, the Suwannee alligator turtle, a snapping turtle. But anyway, we were catching them. And of course, when you have your son there, you say, hey, hold it up and I'll get your picture. So he kind of leaned it up and uh, even the, the snapping turtle smiled. That was pretty cool. And I uh, threw in the, uh, the Lower Suwannee National Wildlife Refuge in the lower, lower 20 miles or so, and actually extends up the Suwannee River is uh, 
critical nesting area. We were designated a critical nesting area for the swallowtail kite. And that was probably about seven, eight years ago or so. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, this is on the riverside. These are some morning, uh, a morning hangout, a roof site for some of the swall uh, swallowtail kites. Because I do surveys every summer uh, for several mornings trying to um, get a establish some uh, baseline data and figure out what's in the area. Because we had quite a few nests in that area. But it was designated a critical nesting area, which is really neat. And uh, some of the coastal ecosystem, I just want to throw some pictures since it's the that top left picture is the last uh, mile or so of the Suwannee River. That's the south pass of the Suwannee River that goes into the Gulf of Mexico. And just some habitat pictures of it's just beautiful uh, bottomland hardwood swamps uh, as opposed to the Okefenokee type of swamp. And again, I got a swallowtail kite there and then just some different habitat shots. This is a really phenomenal picture that I wanted to sh share with y'all. And what it's showing is, and it's an enhanced picture. I think Noah took it or something like that. But anyway, it's a, it shows the large black plume. And again, it's not that dramatic and uh in real life, but it is, and you can see any, even on Google Earth, if y'all ever look on Google Earth or uh, Google Maps or something, turn it to satellite view, and you can see the plume come out pretty much year round. But, uh, and that's a good thing, that's a good plume. You hear, uh, sometimes you hear plumes of bad things like oil and contaminants, but this is all good. Uh, and what it's showing is that uh, the rich, nutrient areas and that what the Suwannee River is pumping out into the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, there's Cedar Keys National Wildlife Refuge that kind of these group of islands down here, but the whole in the Suwannee River and this is South Pass and Suwannee River in the town of Suwannee. But this whole area is just a critical area and it's uh, part of the seagrass preserve which is the state managed property. And they have uh, a million acres or so of the seagrass that manages the seagrass preserve. And that seagrass of course is there, but a lot of, lot, the big, one of the big reasons is because of the Suwannee River, but the, the diversity and biodiversity and uh, the richness of this area is all because of that Suwannee River. And it's um, uh, the manager of the Lower Suwannee, Andrew Gouda is a, a buddy of mine, but he's a, marine scientist, uh, a trained marine scientist that later converted to refuge management. But uh, he eloquently describes the, the Suwannee estuary as the womb of the Gulf. And that's, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice little uh, term, but that means a lot in how critical this area is to a lot of these, uh, even the species out in the the deep oceanic species that are out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and along the coast, they need these rich nursery grounds. And this is what this area is. And um, it, it maintains the richness of the Gulf of Mexico and uh, probably more significant than anybody ever really has figured um, how rich this area is. And it's all because of the Suwannee River and how valuable that the water quality and quantity comes down that river. And I know there's some challenges with water quality and maybe in the future more so with quantity, but, uh, but for the most part, it's really, really good. And, uh, you know, we got to keep protecting it for that reason. Uh, and the Suwannee River is the 10th largest river draining into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it, it discharges approximately 600, 6,294 million gallons per day into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, just a phenomenal, um, how valuable the Suwannee River is to the, the Gulf of Mexico, but all the, even the um, aquaculture in that Cedar Key area. At one time, I think it was 70% of the um, aquaculture clams in the, in the country came from the Cedar Key. I don't know if that 
number has been maintained or not. I know they've got uh, hit by hurricanes, and I'll cover a little bit about that uh, in, in a little bit. And Cedar Keys National Wildlife Refuge, and you remember the little islands down there. There's uh, quite a few little islands that are part of it, but it's uh, established in 1929, so that's an early refuge, like Oki, uh, like Oki Finoki, and uh, also in the earlier days in 1903 with Pelican Island. So it was established early on, and it was established primarily to protect the 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 shorebirds and um, seabirds, wading birds that all nested on these islands. There were thousands of them and they were just taking them. <laughs> they were just being shot indiscriminately and mainly for fe the feathers. Because if you have ever noticed the birds, uh, nesting birds, wading birds with those nice plume feathers during breeding season, uh, they were for, uh, they were shot and uh, plucked for the fashion of the day was ladies' hats, mainly in Europe and some of the big cities up in the Northeast and all. So they were just coming down here and shooting our birds indiscriminately all throughout Florida. But uh, luckily we protected this area and those, actually the rookeries are still there and we have upwards of uh, usually from 20 to 60,000 birds nest on those islands, depending on the year. Uh, but four islands were uh, uh, are actually established as um, as a wilderness, and there's 379 acres that are part of that are made up. Those those four islands total 379 acres, which make up the wilderness, which is the national wilderness within the national wilderness system. And Cedar Keys hosts approximately 50,000 visitors each year. So there's a lot of visitors that come through there. And some of the wildlife, what I want to show you is one of the, the terrapin. It's called an ornate terrapin. It's very unique. The color scheme is very unique. It's very localized in this area. Um, and um, I don't know what the production status is. We I've worked with some of the guys that went out and we caught some is something we don't um, advertise as far as where we catch them because there's they're so vulnerable to the pet trade and you know sometimes it's hard to comprehend that people will actually go out there and they'll catch them uh they'll try and find where they are and they'll of course they want to know where they are and they'll they'll actually there's there was a, a investigation and there was a a biological tech that was working with the state that actually told some collectors where these were and uh, they came out there and collected them and uh, ended up being a big problem but uh, so we had where they where we where, where we locate them where these nesting populations are because they're so they're becoming uh, more and more threatened but anyway some pictures uh, some of the rookeries uh, that top right picture and the the middle picture on the top is that's you know a bunch of birds just hanging out um, during nesting season. But uh, just Cedar Keys is just a phenomenal place because of the, uh, it's just a breeding ground for everything. Uh, not only the birds, but for the, the fisheries and uh, marine mammals and turtles and everything else. And I just want to, uh, I'm near the end, but I wanted to talk about the National Wilderness Preservation System because I've mentioned both wilderness and uh, both Okefenokee and Cedar Keys. Um, it was in 1964, Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the National Wilderness Preservation Act. Um, and since then, 762 designated wilderness areas have been um, established covering 111 million acres. And of course, Okefenokee is the third largest in the eastern um, half of the United States. And there's a little quote there about um, why it's uh, uh, was deemed so important to establish these wilderness areas. And wilderness areas give it uh, extra protection above the National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, just protecting activities that go on out there. 
In other words, what you can still go out there and recreate and fish and hunt. Sometimes motorboats are restricted, um, uh, and different different uh, outdoor activities are restricted if it causes a disturbance in that wilderness area. But uh, fishing and kayaking, canoeing and bird watching and photography and all that's allowed. So don't be uh, don't fear the sign that says now national wilderness. That means it's protected for you and your um, relatives forever and that's pretty much I think uh, that's it and if y'all have any questions I don't I don't think I have it that's for the most part it I always thought the wilderness sign meant you have to get wild from this point on <laughs> yes yes um, yep yeah. It's it's definitely uh, wildlife beyond that sign. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, we got some great great wilderness areas and um, but great resources for people to come and enjoy. And uh, we we are open and uh, ready to to share our passion for the resource. And that's Swanee, the whole Swanee system is a phenomenal resource that we need to protect and we're trying to protect it on we're doing a good job on both ends so hopefully we can do it in the middle as well all right just just remind me again which are the four refuges you're counting the okefenokee national wildlife refuge the banks lake national wildlife refuge both uh, are essentially the headwaters of the swanee the okefenokee being the primary headwaters what establishes the Swanee River and um, in the lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge and the Cedar Keys National Wildlife Refuge are managed together and they're both on the the coastal portion of the Swanee River where it flows into the Gulf of Mexico and they're they're essentially almost the boundaries touch down yeah, there so that's the one that was confusing me so lower Swanee and cedar key are managed together but you're counting them separately as four that makes sense now yes yes yeah those are the four refuges and both of them they're all in <laughs> are directly um uh, involved in the the, the swanee system perhaps so, you could dispel a an urban legend that circulates in florida Legend is that when there's big rains in Georgia, the state of Georgia opens the Suwannee River sill and floods the state of Florida. <laughs> uh, yes, well, the the uh, maybe back in the day when they first established it, uh, but there, it did not impound the water that they uh, they expected. But so it really, really never did the. Uh, held back the water they, they thought they could. But yes, the sill and the, it's left open. And I don't even think we can close them anymore, but there's also uh, breaches. There's three different breaches along the dike. So water can freely flow through those breaches. They've been dug out. So it's, there's no old water control structures like are on two sites that are open. There's other breaches that are just been cut through the dike itself. So water can flow uh, naturally uh, at high water, low water. It all flows naturally. Just like right. it's supposed to be. Whenever I hear that rumor, I can just play them this clip. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's there. There's no impeding of the water. Uh, at some point, we'd like to remove those the concrete structures that are left, even though they don't hold water, they do kind of uh, block some of the trees, that the dead fallen trees that flow down. Mm. Uh, they kind of get blocked up there and can block a little bit of water, but we try and keep them removed the best we can. Um, I have a, a little trivia about Banks Lake. Well, first of all, I trust you know that we go out there every full moon to 
paddle out in the evening to watch the sunset and the moon rise. Michael Lusk came with us on Halloween. Maybe you'd like to join us someday. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Yeah, that's uh that's a special place uh, to get out amongst those cypress trees and uh, mm -hmm. you can get lost and uh, not lost, lost. You can in your mind go to a yeah. better go to a better place and forget about everything that's going uh, the the man-made problems of the world. You can just kind of disappear out there amongst all the cypress trees. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. The other trivia about Banks Lake is it actually drains three ways. It drains north through Mill Creek through Lakeland into the Alapaha River. It drains east through another creek whose name escapes me at the moment into the Alapaha River. And it drains west through Mission Bay by Moody Air Force Base and then around into Grand Bay, which then drains into Grand Bay Creek, which, as you mentioned, joins with Mud Swamp Creek to form the Alapahoochee River, which runs into the Alapaha River in Florida, which, of course, goes into the Suwannee. So it's kind of like the um, Okefenokee in that it's at the... It's like top of the hill and it drains more than one way out. Yes. And I, again, I've never really uh, 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 dove into the hydrology like that, but uh, I know it goes different directions. Uh, formally, it goes out towards Lakeland because of the water control structure that's there that was built back when the mill pond was established. But uh, yes, it does flow out uh, different directions. It's quite a, a, a neat place and uh, really unique. And it's, uh, yeah, good for paddling and motorboats. Just watch out for stumps. They, there's a lot of them, but uh, oh, yeah. just be slow. More paddling. Uh I think Susie has had to go do something, but she left you something in the chat. Um, here, I'll read it for you. Very informative. Enjoyed it much. What a great job you have. Our refuges are priceless. Oh, good. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We, we got to um, cherish our national wildlife refuges. They're special places and they're they're owned by the American people, and we just encourage people to come out and enjoy their their property. Although they're they're managed and there's some protections and regulations, but for the most part, if you just enjoy watching and experiencing uh, outdoor recreation, we're open and we're inviting. We enjoy people coming out, and we have visitor centers at the, quite a few of our refuges, and uh, we'll be glad to spread the word and spread the the what we do and why we do it well there you go well i sure do appreciate you doing this as you know it's going to be available on youtube so once we stick it up in a few days you can share it around wherever you like and i uh, hope it helps gets the word out about the great work y'all do at the refuges well thank you yeah i, I really really appreciate y'all and what y'all do and uh just to be a Glad to be a part of it and be a partner with y'all. All righty. Thanks again and bye for now. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye. Okay.